Wet Work Media presents Dan Lauer's Post Meridium, an unreliable memoir of madness in Los Angeles. Part 1 Psychosis, Chapters 1 through 5. Two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in the universe, or we are not. Both are equally terrifying. Arthur C. Clarke My blood pressure was very, very low. I was either not alive, or perhaps worse, a zombie. And that seemed a hefty cliché to me. Even in that environment, under those circumstances, they'd make a movie out of this one day and someone better looking and more charismatic would play my part. Only it would be a movie, so I would be a zombie. But I'd be in love with a woman who shouldn't love me back but did, even though I tried to eat her whenever she was near. Two thumbs up for this charming little rom zom -com. The nurse taking my blood pressure was a pretty blonde in her early 30s named Sharon, and she was personable, pleasant, and comforting. Under normal circumstances, I would have instinctively turned on the charm and flirted with her just to pass the time. Made her laugh. I can make them laugh. It's one of the very few things I'm truly great at and comes to me more easily than it by all right should. But I was severely exhausted and finding it impossible to focus. Forget flirting. Forget getting hard. Forget fucking. My libido was hiding in a darkened corner somewhere, crying, still wet from a long shower that just wouldn't get hot enough, hard as I tried to turn the knob to the left. If Helen of Troy herself was straddling me, breasts out, and gyrating on my groin, whispering sweet nothings into my ear close enough that I could feel the heat and moisture of her breath in my cheek and her tongue in my earlobe, I would shrug her off while attempting not to betray my cold exterior and display the panic I felt inside. Not right now, Helen. Luckily, the odds of that happening were almost unthinkably slim. Stranger things have occurred. Not much. Not yet. None of this can possibly be real. Everything is out of focus. Sharon asked the standard questions to attempt to get out in front of the situation as quickly as possible. Are you hearing voices? Are you seeing things? Are you delusional? No. No. I'm not sure. The phone next to Sharon's desk kept ringing as we talked. After ignoring it for a few moments, she answered and spoke in a hushed, hurried voice. I couldn't make out what she was saying, but could ascertain the same person kept calling over and over and over and didn't believe whatever Sharon was telling them. She looked frustrated and was trying but failing to hide it. After ending the hushed phone call, she turned back to me, then shifted her gaze back to my chart on the desk in front of her to find where we'd left off. You're not sure if you're delusional, she asked, lifting her head from the chart and cocking it at me in confusion. It was a really big move, jarring. I withdrew, both in the chair and figuratively. Suddenly the warmth was gone from her tone. Are unrealistic situations becoming apparent? Are you in fear for your safety? Are you paranoid? Do you feel like you're being followed? I considered all of that for a moment and shrugged. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you, yes? Those things aren't entirely untrue, if that's what you're driving at. Okay, she scribbled again on my chart. No one would press me for information too intensely. If I looked confused, frustrated, or on the verge of tears and didn't appear to feel like elaborating, all I'd have to do is say, I don't know, twice. Then they'd stop asking. I began to tell everyone, I don't know, twice, no matter the question. Are you feeling suicidal, she asked, and I nodded. Just a nod. Just a visual confirmation. Nothing more to it than that. Don't make me say it out loud anymore. Don't make me admit it to anyone else. Okay, Sharon smiled, reached out with a long finger tipped with red nail polish, touched me slightly on the knee. 
and gave me one of the most sympathetic looks I'd ever received. Does she treat all of the doomed this way? Or am I especially bad off? Or was she expecting me? Is this all part of it? Was this plan too? Sharon left for a moment to find my position in the emergency room. The ER proper and the psychiatric ER were two different facilities. The ER doctor assigned to me on intake had to sign me over to the psychiatric ward after making a cursory diagnosis, but Sharon couldn't leave me alone, so she asked another nurse to keep an eye on me while she was gone. The other nurse was an obese black woman in ill-fitting scrubs, and keep an eye on me is exactly what she did. All she did. She just stared blankly and didn't utter a single word, breathing heavily through her mouth all the time, a slight wheeze on every exhale. I didn't even try to smile as we maintained painfully awkward eye contact. I was only with her for three or four minutes before Sharon returned. I smiled up at her, my new best friend. If I could have bared the thought of human contact, I would have tried to give her a hug but I recoiled when she took my pulse. A hug wouldn't have been worth the effort and would have ended in disaster. Later, after more questions and more stares from people I barely recall, deep eyes burning fiery holes into me, I was led down the hospital corridors and after passing through the inner ER, beds and all, by a Hispanic male nurse, I felt drunk. The nurse's name was Carlos. While walking down the corridor, he looked at me, considered small talk, and then turned away without saying a word. I saw exactly why in his eyes. There's no point in trying, I could see him thinking. The boy is clearly out to lunch. The psychiatric ER beyond the initial waiting room had its own waiting room and its own bulletproof glass. I had some more papers to fill out and did so in a hand that was absolutely not my own. It belonged to some anonymous maniac I'd often judged on the street while he was imploring the Buddha to retrieve the money he'd lost on Papa's mustache in the third at Belmont or to get that damn implant out of his brain once and for all. The glass partition in front of me was more reflective than the last, and I glimpsed myself for the first time that day. I was something less than human, My hair was sticking up wildly, eyes red, face puffy and stained with continuous rounds of tears that seemed to come and go at will, and independently of any set of circumstances, shirt baggy, collar loose from sweating in the heat, pinned eyes like some sort of doll discarded on a rainy post-Christmas trip to the local dump. Million-yard stare. I sat for a few minutes and waited. I didn't know what I was waiting for, and I didn't care. No one asked me anything. There were no papers to fill out. What was disturbing, though, is that people kept talking about me instead of to me. This was real and not a delusion. I remember vividly. Someone would see me, then look to the person watching over me and ask, what's the coding? Invariably, the second person would look at me and then up to this other person and reply, SI. I would have been more comfortable had the code been a little harder to decipher. I think we all know what SI means. Why not just say it? S-I, S-I, S-I. After another 20 minutes, I was ushered into what looked like a small interrogation room. It was sparse, only a small wooden desk, uncomfortable wooden chairs, and a box of tissues. Glass lined the walls of the room, and the clerical heart of the ER lay just beyond, and to my left from where I sat. And I was in a fucking fishbowl. This was not an advisable place to stick a person who was already severely paranoid. I felt their eyes on me, judging me, prying, intruding, not minding their business. Another nurse, a Caucasian man named Paul, entered the room with my chart. It was growing thicker every time it made a new appearance and had grown to nearly three inches in width in the span of an hour and a half. He sat at the table across from me and opened the chart. Paul did not share Karen's kindly disposition. That was apparent immediately. He wore a frown, and the lines in his forehead were deep enough to ski down. I was clearly his last patient of the day, and he was done pretending to give a fuck. Nevertheless, there was protocol to be followed, whether he felt like it or not. He needed to issue another status update. 
It had been at least 20 minutes since I'd been asked the questions. I knew the song by heart. Now, follow the bouncing ball. Nurse Paul, are you hearing voices? Are you seeing things? Are you delusional? Me. No. No, I'm not sure. Nurse Paul, you're not sure if you're delusional? Are unrealistic situations coming alive to you? Are you in fear for your safety? Are you paranoid? Me. I don't know. Nurse Paul, okay. And are you feeling suicidal? Me. Yes. I would really like to die right now. Nurse Paul. Okay. Now, everybody. Do you have a plan? Nurse Paul asked me, his eyes still affixed to the new page on the chart. For what? I didn't look at him either. Just kept my eyes locked on the box of tissues. Did you consider a time for your suicide? A place? A method? Not really. This was mostly true. The place was my apartment, but only because I didn't have anywhere else to go. It wasn't a plan as much as a lack of options. The method? Pills and alcohol seemed nice and clean. I didn't own a gun or a length of rope long enough to hang myself. I'm afraid of heights, and anyway, my duplex was only two stories tall. Did you, though? Did I, though, what? You're pissing me the fuck off, Paul, if that is your real name. I got your number. Did you have a plan? Did you consider a time for your suicide, a place, a method? I answered all over again. My mind ached with all the harsh realities of the situation, and I couldn't think and couldn't answer any more questions. The eyes on me were crawling up my skin. I was growing agitated, cantankerous, violent. I was becoming all the time more certain this was all a misunderstanding somehow. Explaining the depression question to my classmates was easier said than done. Shame. I felt so much shame. I broke up with Anna and told her it wasn't her, it was me. But it wasn't me, it was her. She was so fucking clingy. I mean, a phone call every day? Come on, I'm depressed, and I can't be shackled like that. I am sick of her, and naive enough to believe girls who really love and understand you come along every other day. They do not. Occasionally, I fantasize about meeting my 14-year-old self in a darkened alleyway and having just a few minutes of quality time with him to get a few things straight. Do you have any idea... How great you have it. I mean, I know you're suffering, but you don't have to be such a prick about it. I would scream as the ass-kicking commenced and continued through the days and nights of the scorching summers of my formative years. My glory days, when I couldn't not get laid. It was a real gas. The same conversation would happen over and over again in the hallways and cafeteria after the rumor mill began to churn. Here. So you have depression? Me. Yeah. Here. You try to off yourself? Me. No. Here. But you thought about it. Me. Yeah. Here. But didn't do it. Me. What? Kill myself? Here. Yeah. Me. Uh, no. And then... As I have the nasty habit of doing, I got bored. Peer, so you have depression? Me, yeah. Peer, you try to off yourself? Me, sure. Peer, wow. How? Version one, suicide by cop. I knocked over a 7-Eleven with a phony piece and then waited around for the cops to show once the silent alarm was tripped. When they got there, we had a standoff and I drew down on them. They were just about to shoot me when the sergeant on the scene noticed I had the same cap gun as his son. They backed off. Version 2. Jumped from the Hilton downtown. I was actually only 15 feet from the ground when a sudden updraft caused a water spout from the ocean that swept under me and knocked me into the pool. I was unconscious and this close to drowning, but the Hawaiian Tropic female volleyball team was there sunbathing topless and resuscitated me for a few hours back in their room. Version 3. It was so fucked up, I have actually blocked out the memory completely. Suffice to say, I'm still alive. 
The worst part is that some high school classmates bought big chunks of all three stories at one time or another. The Florida public school system leaves much to be desired. Several hours before I found myself in the fishbowl, the sun was radiating down on a remote area of a CVS parking lot, furthest from other cars and consumers. I parked there, facing an empty lot behind a chain-link fence, grown over with thick vine and withering tumbleweeds so I could keep my windows down without being near passing ears. They would listen with heads cocked and eyes narrowed. Always they listened. I could feel it. I had to keep my windows down because the engine was off to save gas, and anyway, my air conditioning was broken. It had been for months, and the money needed to fix it, to have the vacuum tested, to find the leak was astronomical. It was going to cost around $200. $200. At that point in my life, $200 was an absurd sum. When you are completely broke, there is no difference between $200 and $200 million. I didn't have the former, and the latter would always be out of the question. Look, air conditioning is the MacGuffin in this movie. In that boiling car, the extraterrestrial was scolding me. Always inconsistency in the dialogue. It ambled in every direction, shifting focus, theme, suggestion, never staying on message for too long, keeping me on uneven ground. This is a fine mess you've gotten us into. I'm just stunned, shocked and appalled at the level of self-destruction you're exhibiting these days. You've stubbornly refused to achieve a single goal since we moved out here. And how lofty those goals were. Despite my efforts in dragging you, kicking and screaming, I don't seem to be getting any thanks at all, not one bit. I'm starting to take it personally, if you want to hear the truth. And soon you'll be sitting in a huge white room, sterile and with plastic furniture covered in graffiti Mexicano, and you want these people to get rid of me. Well, good fucking luck. We've been a lot of places together, my friend. Now we're in L.A. I bet you thought things would change. Tears slithered down his face. He stared at his feet. I thought I could run from you. I thought you wouldn't find me here, he said. We're past that now. Just eat a bullet, buy a rope, chase a bottle of ibuprofen with a bottle of Johnny Walker. Do you know what they say? They say that's how you're going to die. They say this so-called disease of yours is fatal, terminal. They say you just can't hack it. Nobody thinks that, he said. I would never lie to you. Who are you going to believe, me or them? Them. They're laughing at you. That's not true. It is. And worse than that, John is fucking Joanna right now. He's not really at work. She's not really at an audition. He is violently sodomizing her at her request. And the pillow talk afterward will only be about you. Dozens of people watching on a live feed. And afterward, a moderated chat room about how stupid and naive and pathetic you are. And then comes the laughter. Fuck you. Yes, for certain. Can you hear them laughing? Do you hear what they're saying? Die, die, die. A number had been entered but not dialed in the cellular phone in my right hand. 800-784-2433. If you were to break those last seven digits down into alphabetical code related to a phone keypad, you would discover a very illustrative word vis-a-vis the current situation. Trust me, I hadn't showered or slept in days, hadn't smiled in weeks, hadn't spoken even a hushed word in a few hours, and hadn't stopped crying for over 30 minutes. It stands to reason that I must have looked like a grotesque caricature of myself. The cartoon of the sad clown, seen it? My eyes stung, and my face was wet, greasy, and sallow, like something once organic and living, but that had long since died and been left to bloat in the sun or beneath dozens of feet of the putrid contents of the local landfill. My head ached, and there was a constant nagging thump in my chest that I was sure must have been a heart attack. Nothing else could have been that painful. But why then? So young. 
I was having trouble focusing on my surroundings and my thoughts were frantic and yet somehow slow on the uptake. Couldn't remember how I got to that particular parking lot and was unsure of how far I was from my apartment. But did know that I'd left some time in the recent past for no particular reason. I just had to get out and left wearing the same cargo shorts, t-shirts, and sandals I'd been wearing for five days in a row. The cigarette in my left hand was burnt down to the filter and it crackled with the smoldering wrapping paper and seeds in the tobacco. But I hadn't taken a drag since I lit it some moments ago, having somehow forgotten that that was the point of lighting a cigarette. This happened many times over the course of the last half hour, and I was midway through a pack without having inhaled yet. Don't inhale. And then I was staring long and hard at the number on the phone, trying to talk myself off the edge of the cliff. Let's have a serious discussion, you and I. You are overreacting. Things are not this bad. You just need to get some sleep. Maybe have a drink and take a deep breath. A series of deep breaths have ended wars and repaired fractured relationships. They will save your life if you will just try. Stop crying, Dan. Everything is going to be just fine. I don't believe me. I'm a liar. I don't really want to kill myself. I just don't want to do it anymore. And what is it? It is anything. I am sick and tired of being this sick and tired. That and fuck. I'm giving into monstrous cliches like so many do in moments like these. When you're too tired to think of anything new and you're left only with what has come before and you hate it and love it simultaneously because cliches are only cliched because they're true and they work when there isn't time for anything else. Fuck, get a grip, comes that old voice. I know it well. It speaks to me every year or so. Tells me to cool out, relax, have a sip and a drag, just ride the wave. This is going to happen whether you fight it or not, and it's always easier if you don't. I know the voice better than I know my own. It's louder and more assured. It wins, sitting in its corner, perched precariously atop the ledge of a high-rise somewhere in the darkness, where it's always just like nighttime, rocking back and forth on brand new leather shoes, and there's nothing surrounding the high-rise, nor the voice, nothing to block it out. It sits alone with no background noise. This is the extraterrestrial toying with me. Anatomy of delusional paranoia. At night, if I hear a loud TV or a muffled car passing through the walls, I sense hushed voices all focused on me. He knows something, they whisper. I think he can hear us. They are plotting my downfall, the central figure in an international intrigue that has no name and no specific face or purpose as it echoes through hallways, bounces down corridors, and shifts madly around blind corners. Sometimes I catch glimpses of it here and there always too late to witness anyone in the act. They're good, these people. It isn't cinematic, but something is underway. I can't tell you how, but I know. There are so many cold, strange faces on the streets of L.A. Trekking through Hollywood to get to work, I take all the main drags, get stuck in traffic a lot, have time to look around, see the sights, and what sights they are, impossible and heavy, full of bizarre refugees and the sullen hopeful, who have all given up on that old television dream and wander the thoroughfares, helpless and crazed, nudging their belongings and secrets along in their shopping carts, with an ever-present wobbling front wheel dragging them off-center, always off-center. The only thing this town produces anymore is loss and despair, I have fallen victim, just like anyone else. Same old story. Nerves are shattered. There, a man playing with a yo-yo, handcrafted and carved of fine, slick ivory. There's a toddler smoking a cigarette, eyeing the blonde in the skirt, hoisted up around her pelvis, and she, with a strop razor and Irish spring soap, is shaving her pubic hair, which goes cascading and clumped thick black tendrils down the street drain. And he is too young for all the bad noise and too crazed for any other thing. But no one pays much attention. They are not well read in this city. Human contact had become distressing and unpleasant, so I'd done my best to completely abandon it. People were dangerous. That vague sense of knowing and comfortable familiarity had been replaced with desperation 
and the terrifying realization that those around me were watching, listening, and plotting. I had to get out, to get far away, and then to a quiet, dark place where I could afford to be alone with the droning, monosyllabic voices echoing relentlessly in my head, the shadows. I found it impossible to relate to body language or expression. I couldn't recognize faces or voices, particularly when presented with them unexpectedly. Smiles were snarls. Frowns were fear. Laughter was screaming. Shrugs were clear and present signs of aggression. Hugs represented imminent bodily harm. Sex was death. It is better to be thought insane and remain silent than to open my mouth and remove all doubt. For certain, no one would argue that anymore. Not at a time like this. It was a lonely, terrifying existence, and I knew I was in trouble. Fucked. The pain I was experiencing hour to hour is almost indescribable. The pain of heartbreak, paralyzing fear, all because I'm too reptilian. My prefrontal lobe is too small. My adrenaline gland is too big. And my brain can't tell the difference between threats that are real and imagined. Everything is dangerous, forcing the decision moment after moment, fight or flight. I was unable to achieve either, so for the last two days, I had done nothing but lay in bed. I vomited when I ate, and I cried when I tried to talk. That was just as well, though, because that sense of impending doom and intense nondescript paranoia was foremost on my mind. And though I had long been performing a delicate trapeze act, fooling everyone around me with a perfect impression of someone sane, I could no longer prevent those maniacal ramblings from spilling out whenever I opened my mouth. And yet, I knew how crazy they were. My consciousness and my mind are in direct opposition. I couldn't go to work because they were recording my outgoing phone calls and are using the recordings to build a case against me. A case for what? Christ? Krishna? Delusion and madness. I am Ahab. I am Queequeg. Call me Ishmael. My name is Dan, and I am a paid fundraiser. I see that you have donated to the NRDC in the past. Can I put you down for your previous donation, plus an additional $10 a month? This week only, Walmart is matching all donations. We know who you are. Panic. Uh, who am I? dread. Why? You know. Oh, you know. Tears well. My name is Dan, and I am just a paid fundraiser. Everyone is looking at me. I can't focus or breathe. Now hear this. We need someone's help because we are dying. Four days ago, I have what I think is the flu. Bad scene. I can barely move. My whole body aches, so I stay in bed. Some other things went on. Perhaps I went out with friends, had drinks, perhaps made it to a restaurant or two, certainly bought cigarettes, but no specific memory remains. None of that happened. I was on a spaceship, though, circling some nearby star, which was rapidly expanding into a red giant eager to consume me. That much is very clear. I remember waking up somewhere in the vicinity of the 5 o'clock hour on what was perhaps a Monday, or a day suspiciously reminiscent of a Monday, to the sound of the front door buzzer in my apartment. Everything is freezing on my body except my head. It burned with a horrible fever. Horrible. Sweat beads slithered on my brow and upper lip. Were we expecting company? Was I hearing things? The door buzzed again. I moved from my air mattress to open it. But it opened as if via its own will before I got there. Someone I recognized vaguely stepped inside. Where was my roommate? This person was not him. How do I know her? I'm half asleep and fully insane. I can't handle it without a word. I retreat to the bathroom and sit inside of the tub. I hear them moving outside. Shh. I'm afraid to breathe. Don't move a muscle. Don't say a word. This is exactly the moment they've been waiting for. She knocked on the door. Are you okay? She asked in a loud, panicked voice. I didn't say a word. I just shook my head. Once an automated voice assured me that my call was important and that someone was waiting to talk to me, I felt calmer. Not calm, but also not vibrating with fear anymore. I was on the road, couldn't go back from that moment. 
something was underway, and I was relatively certain that by day's end I would have made a decision. Dying was still a completely viable option and one that seemed incredibly easy compared to getting well. Oh, the hours one must dedicate to that. Death takes but a single moment as long as you don't fuck it up. I must be cruel to be kind, as the bard said. It won't hurt, I thought. No, not a bit. It will be just like slipping on cool spring water on a fresh blacktop, and it'll all be over in an instant. You won't even know it happened. Just sit still. I don't believe in an afterlife, so I have no religious guilt related to self-destruction. It was seeming more and more like the right option all the time, and then a tiny melodramatic voice came on the phone. Hello, my name is David. What's your name? What would you like to talk about? Can you speak up? I demanded. I can barely hear you. I was curt and direct, unable or unwilling or both to be polite. One can understand how loud voices and assertive tones could be upsetting to people at a moment like that in the most vicious of your life, but the whisper in his tone instantly frustrated me. David's voice was instantly louder and yet too conversational for my taste. Sure, sorry. What's your name? Dan. Okay, Dan, what would you like to talk about? David asked. I smiled. In spite of everything swirling around me, all the noise in my head, I found that question incredibly amusing. Why? I can't say. And now is not the time to figure it out. Oh, I don't know. What is there to say right in this moment, David? Would you like to talk about the economic downturn? What are your thoughts? What is your favorite color? Do you have any idea just how fucking crazy I am? Are you recording this? Get the goddamn tap off the phone. I know what you're doing. I wasn't born yesterday, and I don't like being lied to. Don't do it again. Not again. Flashes of frenzy and paranoia. I was breaking down. Lower and lower we go. Madness. So come on, David. This is not my first rodeo. I have dealt with this before, and no solution has taken. I am currently coexisting with an alien being that is insisting that I am part of some vague international conspiracy. Everyone is looking at me. Everything is about me. But no matter, you can make me feel better, can't you? So you're having these feelings again? David asked. Again? What did he mean again? I hadn't told him that I'd been here before, right? Or had I? Was I internal monologuing and talking to him at the same time? Am I doing that right now? Yes, I told him. And these thoughts, paranoia, I think, unless I'm not paranoid, maybe I'm right. Can't tell anymore. And your depression has led to psychosis and delusion before, he asked. The answer was yes. A thousand times yes. My answer was, I don't know. Not really. Liar. David acknowledged every statement of mine with a slight grunt. A nonverbal form of, uh-huh. This gave him just the amount of time he no doubt needed to scroll through his You Have a Lot to Live For script on the small cathode ray tube monitor in front of him. In that dim office, wherever he was, where he was serving a community service sentence or trying to impress a girl who liked charitable guys, David is in over his head. He began speaking again, but I cut him off. Why was I lying to him? I called for help. I was getting the impression he probably couldn't help me no matter what the situation was, but lying guaranteed that. Actually, I lied just then. You did? He asked, about what? I was powerfully delusional once when I was about 19. I could not shake the horrible sensation, no matter how I tried, that I had killed and then buried my entire family. When I spoke to them on the phone, I was sure that their voices had been co-opted and they had been replaced in person by doppelgangers that were just around to trap me into a confession. Didn't matter how ridiculous it seemed. I just knew that I had killed them. I knew it no matter the evidence of the contrary. Insanity, right? I spoke the words in rapid succession, no breaths between thoughts. Get it out as quickly as possible. It'll be easier that way. Long silence hung on the line between us. I could feel him scrambling through his script. What to say after someone just laid that kind of bizarre trip on you? 
Heavy shit, David. Very heavy. Oh, well, there are other fish in the sea. You'll find a new job, a better one. Money problems can't go on forever. Sooner or later, your kids will move out. I doubted there was an entry cataloged and cross-referenced into any easily accessible order that read, Wow, you sound really fucking nuts. Is this a prank? Sheesh, David said. That sounds pretty scary, huh? Poor David. He couldn't help me. But of course he couldn't, and again I felt lost. What now? There was no what now. That was it. That was the whole plan. He had no idea what to say. How do you argue with hallucinations? How do you convince a psychotic delusional person they have options? These were questions David must have struggled with every day. He hadn't gotten any better at it for the hours and hours he must have practiced. Well, sometimes it's just good to let it out, to talk to somebody. Is there anything specific you'd like to talk about? How is your personal life? He asked sympathetically. None of your fucking business. Where do you get off? You think you're dealing with some sort of fucking child here? Do you? Huh? Am I really supposed to talk to a complete stranger about my personal life? What do you take me for? Fine, I told him, choking back the outburst with an audible gulp. And how about your professional life, he asked. What do you do for a living? I'm an out-of-work screenwriter, I told him, then sighed, realizing I might as well have said, Nothing. An out-of-work writer is nothing, just like an out-of-work doctor is nothing. You might be great at diagnosing obscure disorders of the mind and heart, but if you get laid off and spend your night sipping scotch in your boxers and watching infomercials, you're not a diagnostician anymore. You're a has-been with a gambling problem, debt, and back alimony payments overdue. You're not worth what you paid for med school. Come to think of it, I'm not worth what I paid for my shitty technical college. Are you working on any writing projects right now? David asked. I could picture him leaving in his woven thread ergonomic chair, rocking back and forth softly, tossing pencils into the stucco ceiling, chewing on the lips of his styrofoam coffee cup. He rolled his eyes when I spoke. Perhaps there was someone else in the room that he flapped his hands at, bringing the thumb and four digits together like a duck bill. The universal sign for this fuck is long-winded. Fuck you, David. No, no, not right now, I said. Well, why aren't you writing? Is it the depression? He asked. Suddenly, this was a lame college Q&A. Tell me, where do you get your ideas? Do you write in the morning? Could you take a look at my script? I just don't have any good ideas right now, I tell him. I am fidgeting in my seat, uncomfortable and stuck with sweat, bleeding from both ears, nose running with some dark green liquid, I am melting in the heat and suffering through this bizarre inquisition. I suddenly have the distinct sensation and belief that I am melting. I didn't explain myself soon enough. I'd melt into the wheel well and then spill through the closed driver's door onto the pavement where I'd eventually be washed into the sewers. And that would be the story of me. I see, he said, and then there was a long pause. What else would you like to talk about? He asked. Whatever playbook he was running on me, I didn't understand it. None of it made the slightest bit of sense. None at all. No, 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 just no. I felt like laughing. Another cigarette was burning down between my fingertips. I could see the yellowish, callous nicotine stains on the inside wall of my index and middle fingers. Sweat beads dripped off the gnarled strands of my hair and left delicate droplets on my cargo shorts. My eyes welled with tears. The sun was laughing at me. The parking lot was sinking into the abyss, and now the necromancers were at the gates. If you're enjoying Post Meridium and just cannot get enough of a good thing, it is available for pre order now as a beautiful ebook available from Amazon and Apple Books. The ebook version of Post Meridium includes additional content, illustrations, and even an additional fifth part not included in the free audiobook version. Search for Post Meridium and Dan Lauer on Amazon or Apple or visit wetworkmedia.com slash post dash meridium for more information.